Hi, and welcome to the um, Accelerated Learning Series, the fall series. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, my name is Beth Hill, and I work for the MyMTSS TA Center. And our presenters today are Dr. Andrea Truckenmiller, who is an assistant professor of special education at Michigan State University. She has deep expertise in the assessment of reading and writing through both research and application. When she was at the Florida Center for Reading Research, she directed and developed, directed the development of the statewide reading and writing screening assessments and worked with each county to align the assessment with evidence-based instructional decisions to accelerate learning for all students. Her research work in literacy assessment has resulted in over $5 million of external funding and 25 peer-reviewed publications. She was also a principal contributor to the Early Literacy Assessment System guidance document that she will be referencing in her presentation. Lindy Johnson is also pre presenting and is currently a PhD student in the special education program at MSU and is a scholar with the National Center on Leadership and Intensive Intervention. She has degrees in education and psychology and prior to beginning her doctoral studies, she was an elementary teacher and reading interventionist in the Michigan Public Schools. Her research interests are focused on identifying reliable and valid reading assessment and also on the comorbidity of students with reading disabilities and developmental disabilities, such as autism. So I'm um, welcoming them both to the stage. And just so you know, we will be saving all questions for the last 10 minutes. And I'll be joining them at the end to share your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Beth. I'm really excited for the opportunity to talk with you and to present to everyone in the state of Michigan. Um, welcome. I am going to be talking about um, a lot of things that I've looked at over the years in terms of uh, screening in particular and other types of reading assessment. Um, I dove pretty deep into uh, assessment throughout the years, uh, over the past 15-ish years, and have tried to distill down and uh, synthesize really the most powerful aspects of assessment um, to try to help accelerate learning and um, point you in the place to really start and focus efforts. Um, because I want to really make this as worth your time as possible, I'm going to provide a lot of examples of different assessment products and uh, different interventions. And um, throughout all of my work um, in presenting these different examples, there's often conscious, intentional, and unintentional biases that might pop up. So I want to be as transparent as possible and let you know that I did direct the development of the subtests that are now included in Lexia's rapid assessment. Um, this work that I did was funded uh, through the Institute for Education Sciences grants to Dr. Barbara Foreman at Florida State University. Um, I do not receive any royalties from the sale of that product. However, I do serve on Lexia's Educational Leadership Council, which um, is looking at how we can really accelerate uh, reading for all students across the country, which I do receive a small compensation for that, but again, no royalties for any other products at Lixia. So I wanted to be very transparent about that. That being said, most of the examples that I provide today would be pretty broad. What we would like to do today is talk about how we can streamline assessment in the most powerful ways possible. And for today, I've synthesized that in terms of let's target those essential skills that will accelerate learning. Then let's talk about how we can turn this idea of just database decision making into something that might be more powerful. Um, and looking at uh, decision based data selection. Um, and finally, I want to uh, make sure we talk about how to group students for optimal instruction because not all um, not all plans need to be completely individualized. If you have a classroom with 30 students, you don't need 30 different instructional 
uh, programs for all 30 students, rather they tend to group in predictable ways. And so we will talk about that. And I'm most excited that, um, that Lindy's gonna be here today and she's going to talk about how this actually looks and works um, and is happening in schools. So let's start with that first idea of essential skills um, and the power that accelerating, uh, really prioritizing a few skills in early elementary in particular can really do. And uh, the state of Michigan has been doing a great job of uh, talking about essential skills and highlighting those through the Mesa GLN Network's uh, document that talks about reading essential reading skills. A lot of you have gone through a lot of professional learning around that. And so I wanted to highlight a couple of the research pieces behind this. One of them is a my favorite uh, study of all time uh, conducted by Dr. Benita Blackman at Syracuse University, where she worked with groups of students in grades two and three who were identified as the lowest readers in their schools. And what she did, what their team did, was provide supplemental instruction in essential skills that were most likely to boost learning at that time frame. The reading intervention they used emphasized letter sound connections and words, focused on accurate decoding and word recognition, built fluency and spelling, and included text-based reading. What they found uh, implementing this study was working with these uh, lowest performing students, as you can see by their reading scale scores at uh, the beginning of the study, um, a, an average reading score we would categorize as 100. So you see these students are performing more than a standard deviation below the mean. And after they implemented this intervention for a year, at the post-test and they found the students who received the, the intervention, which was Road to Reading, they performed significantly higher than the students uh, who did not receive that. They just continued with the school's business as usual intervention. One year later, they followed up with these same students and found that the these um, advantages for these students, this acceleration maintained after one year. To me, the most powerful piece of this is when you get it early and you focus on these essential skills, there's also a long-term benefit. They measured these same students 10 years later when they were in high school and graduating from high school and found that the, the treatment effects maintained in their reading scores. But not only was this important for their reading scores, as all of you know very well, reading is so important for many other outcomes. And they found that these students uh, had lower percentages of qualifying for special education services, higher percentages of the students who had the intervention completed high school, and higher percentages attended post-secondary education. To me, this is uh, showing the long-term power for lots of other really important outcomes that all of us educators are really interested in. So what does this have to do with assessment? Well, assessment can play a major piece in identifying those essential skills. And one of those lines of research that has done that is uh, Carol Connor's line of research looking at assessment to instruction. And she found that assessment of essential skills early in elementary school in reading can lead to selecting more effective instruction for the students for which it's matched to. So she measured her and her team measure students with different reading skills. Some were high or low in decoding and some were high or low in vocabulary. And she gave different amounts of instruction to students depending on their profile and found that students made greater gains 
when they receive recommended amounts of each type of instruction based on whatever their score was in those two areas. Very interestingly, she also found that when you match the amount of instruction, the balance of instruction to skill development during grades one, two, and three, after the end of third grade, those students who had received that instruction, their reading, overall reading achievement was accelerated by one full year. And this is the result of seven randomized clinical control trials, so indicating that we have pretty high confidence in these results and very uh, large effect sizes as well. What's nice is they uh, there's a website here that I linked that um, looks at this instruction, the amount of time focused on different pieces of instruction across different late grade levels for uh, different students. So what are these four categories of students? Um, well, like I said, we had this, uh, Carol Connor and her team measured decoding as well as vocabulary. So for the decoding skills, they found that students who had weaker decoding skills, when provided more time in decoding instruction, with more teacher-directed explicit instruction and less independent reading time, with gradual increases of amount of time focused on meaning-focused instruction led to greater reading gains for those students. Those students who had strong decoding skills, if they got more time with this teacher-directed code-focused instruction, they made weaker gains in their overall reading achievement. When looking at the students with weaker vocabulary, they found that more teacher-directed vocabulary instruction with a little bit less time in independent reading led to the greatest gains in reading achievement with those students. Whereas for those students who already had strong reading skills, the more time they spent in independent reading led to stronger overall reading gains for those students. Um, and this uh, particular set of research is highlighted in that early literacy assessment system guidance document in uh, section 3.3, which was pages 83 to 92, if you ever want to um, get that document and, and zero in on that information. So we talked about the impact that in intervention and instruction on essential skills can have for accelerating learning and that measuring some of those those pieces will help us match instruction to students so if we think about what are those essential skills so that we can identify the assessment and as well as the instruction that uh, really gets at those essential skills. Let's look more closely at what the research has shown are those essential skills. In that early literacy assessment system guidance document, we provide a graphic to help conceptualize how uh, finer grain essential skills um, fit into medium and larger grain constructs of reading. And I'm also going to provide in here some um, specific assessments that measure those essential skills. Let's start with our ultimate goal of reading. Of course, we want students to be able to comprehend what they read. This is where we're very familiar with those summative assessments and some interim assessments that capture this large grain construct domain of reading comprehension. Often we want to know how students are progressing in meeting these um, usually end of year grade level standards. And so we need some quick signal of how students are doing in their overall reading comprehension. And that's where a lot of uh, assessments find that 
the construct oral reading fluency is one signal that's really quick and easy to benchmark uh, students' um, learning progression, overall progression towards meeting those uh, end of year reading comprehension goals. Then if we break down overall reading comprehension, we have a ton of research and a, a few of those studies that, that demonstrate this research are listed there at the bottom of the screen. We find that, like Carol Connor's work, if we measure the uh, language comprehension and uh, decoding piece of reading, we have an idea of how we can broadly focus the minutes of instruction that students are, are receiving in, in those two broad areas. And many of the assessments that we will use on an interim basis or a screening basis or a benchmarking basis have uh, subscores within those systems that tell us what it is, which one of these the student has strengths or weaknesses in so that we can, we can balance that, that instruction. But then um, that's still not enough to make all of our instructional decisions. We need to break down um, sometimes where students are struggling with uh, different pieces of reading or figuring out where they are in some sub-skills of reading development so we can move that development forward and accelerate that. And so we need more fine-grained assessment and the constructs or the reading domains that we find predict, for example, decoding our students' development of phonological awareness, which is the sound parts of uh, speech, then the orthographic knowledge, so the letters and letter combinations that match the sounds that we hear in speech, as well as morphological awareness, the chunks of words that have specific meaning attached to them. Um, within the language comprehension component, we can break that down further into specific vocabulary at the word level, knowledge of sentence structures, syntax at the sentence level, and then looking at um, inference making at the discourse level and use of strategies to guide that. So you see here there's uh, lots of options available for assessments that, that get at this. The, the tricky part then is, okay, we have these assessments of specific skills now we need to find the intervention that has an impact on those skills that we're targeting that can then have the overall impact on reading achievement, which then has those long-term outcomes that we want to see. Uh, the, our best bet for, for finding these are to look at instruction that's demonstrated an impact on these essential skills. There are several places that I'm very excited people have been working on to uh, make these more accessible, including the Evidence for ESSA website, the What Works Clearinghouse, and Michigan especially working on the My Strategy Bank to, uh, to aggregate those. One of my frustrations has been um, trying to dig through the What Works Clearinghouse website, trying to find what specific um, essential skills are being targeted by different interventions, and I had a hard time doing that. So uh, my colleagues and I at MSU, we went through the What Works Clearinghouse website and we looked at the effect sizes on specific skills, uh, the essential skills that I identified in that previous graphic. And we published some tables in an article that is published in the Communique for 2020. We we gave examples of these assessments, the constructs or domains and reading that they're measuring, and then we lined it up with first some instructional routines, some evidence-based instructional routines that are um, in the IES practice guides where they talk about the foundational skills of reading. And then we also have a table of programs, the different commercial programs that 
address and have had an impact on these different essential skills so that it's in an easier, consumable place. Okay, so we have assessment of essential skills and we have intervention that can impact those essential skills. The hardest part now is putting it all together so that it works nicely within a system. Uh, like a, a living, breathing school building and how, how to do that. So we're going to talk about uh, database decision making. But I don't know about you. Um, I found in sitting in many, many data meetings where we're discussing uh, what to do with the assessment data. It's assessment data that's already been collected and everybody is given a report that has a whole bunch of different types of data on it. And they say, okay, let's look at the data and um, make some instructional decisions. And I find what this ends up doing is kind of putting the cart before the horse, where it's like, okay, I'm trying to process all of this data and figure out what to do as opposed to knowing exactly what this data is supposed to do. And there's so many different data points. Which one is the one that is going to work best for me in the role that I serve at this school? So we developed this framework in the Early Literacy Assessment System Guidance, where uh, there's four big things for schools and school teams to think about. We have different users of the same data or um, different users who need different types of data because they have different decisions that they need to make that accelerate learning. And um, we need to make sure that the data points we're choosing for specific decisions has evidence to support that use. And then um, we want to make sure we're, we're actually assessing a reading domain that's actually most useful for this level of instructional decision that we're making. So I'm going to briefly go through these. Uh, first, we have a lot of different users that play very important roles in promoting student outcomes. And they all are, are very important to this. So if there's an assessment that's um, useful for one group, it may not be useful for another. One thing that I've seen at a, at a data team that really um, exemplified this issue is uh, when looking at, for example, reading screening assessment, the administrators uh, at the school leadership team meeting they were really interested in the overall results of the reading screening because they were like, okay, I need to staff the school in terms of how to um, get the right number of kids in supplemental intervention that, that needs to occur. So I need to know how many students, which students are at risk or not at risk. Teachers looking at that same data point say, I already know which of my students need supplemental instruction. What I really need to know to fulfill my role and help student learning move forward is what specific skill, literacy skills uh, should I focus on for this particular student or group of students to move instruction forward. So it's really important that instead of putting a data report right in front of everybody first, saying, okay, we have some scores that are going to tell us who needs supplemental instruction, and we have some scores that are going to tell us what those students need instruction in. Before we look at the data, let's identify exactly what decisions that we're trying to be, that we're going to make here today. And then what specific data points do we have evidence that we know helps us make that decision? Um, so here's an example of uh, decisions that can be made with different pieces of assessment data. So if a teacher is saying, how can I group my students based on their reading interests and learning needs 
I'm going to be using some data points that are at this mid-range level. The, do they need, um, where's my group going to be spending more time on decoding, and where's my group going to be spending more time on vocabulary, for example. This also uh, would help identify um, these these types of assessments that are listed here also help identify which students do need that supplemental instructional time as well. Our, our next question that a teacher might ask and might do their own more fine-grained assessment from there would be what specific literacy skills, especially for those students receiving tier two and tier three instruction, where do they need uh, the targeted support? And this is where I'm really excited uh, to have an interventionist, Lindy, today to talk about those pieces in particular and how she does that. Another decision that's really important for accelerating learning is are students making progress now that they're getting this more focused intervention or instruction? Are they making progress towards those end of year expectations? And that's where we need a more sensitive metric, um, but ends up being at, at a larger grain level, um, something like the oral reading fluency probes for older students or the um, early literacy fluency probes for the younger elementary students. All right, so we have these decisions that we're making with different users in mind. But there's also an, another hierarchy of decision that we need to keep in mind, and that's the stakes that are given to the consequences of what happens after those decisions are made. So some decisions that we make um, have pretty important uh, consequences, long-term consequences for children that can't readily be reversed. <clears throat> so for example, special education identification, or uh, in some states, retention, where these decisions are very high stakes. So when we have very high stakes decisions, we need to make sure we have very high levels of reliability, validity, and fairness in the data points that are being used to make that decision that there's multiple data points. I'm not gonna focus so much on high stakes uh, decisions today because when we're talking about accelerating learning, uh, what we really want to focus on are these moderate stakes and lower stakes decisions that are being made every day that build up over time to then lead to some of our more high stakes decisions. The moderate stakes decisions, this is usually placement types of decisions where the, if we make an error in our decision, um, if the student has still um, had some kind of consequence of, of, of some type of placement, but we can readily change that within um, a few weeks time and, and correct that error. So we, we want to have some pretty good evidence that the decision we're making is, is um, supported by the research data for making these types of decisions. Day-to-day -day decisions like uh, reteaching certain skills to certain students, these are lower stakes decisions that can be readily changed the next day. So here we don't need uh, this psychometric power. Um, in other words, we don't need these levels of reliability, validity, and fairness demonstrated. So this is my favorite part and for all of the nerds out there, um, I know you're hiding and liking the technical adequacy side of this as well. Um, I never thought I would be this into it, but uh, technical adequacy of assessment is really fascinating to me in finding that evidence for which types of decisions we're making. And what's uh, handy is that evidence can be quantified and all you need to know um, to dive into this you don't have to be um, you have to have taken multiple uh, psychometric courses or anything 
uh, evidence is quantified on a range of 0 to 0.99. And it, these all of the values for reliability and validity are on the scale of 0 to 0.99, where 0.99 is the most impossible highest amount of reliability and validity. And so in the document, the Early Literacy Assessment System guidance, we provide the levels of reliability and validity that are needed for different types of decisions. So as I said, for high stakes decisions, there better be multiple data points with very high levels of reliability and validity. You want to see reliability above 0.9. You want to see criterion related validity. This is a correlation with other um, reading achievement metrics at about 0.8. For moderate stakes decisions, we, we can um, use some lower reliability, but still very highly reliable measures at about the 0.8 area. But for low stakes decisions day to day, um, we just need the we need the reliability to be better than chance. Um, and we need content validity. So content validity is just a fancy meaning to say a reading expert or a group of reading teachers would say, yes, this assessment is measuring vocabulary or this assessment is measuring morphology, whatever it is we say that we're, we're trying to measure. A third very, very, very important component of technical adequacy is bias or fairness. So there's um, at least three types of bias to attend to when we're thinking about selecting and using our assessment data. First is the items themselves. Do the items have bias? Uh, are they differentially identifying different groups of students? Luckily, there are ways to measure bias in this way of assessment items. And many uh, commercial vendors are actually measuring this and reporting it. You can find a summary of, of this reliability, validity, and bias analysis if you go to the National Center on Intensive Intervention Screening Tools chart, I have it linked there, and just selected um, a set of commonly used reading measures in the state of Michigan. And you can see each of these measures for students in early elementary have good reliability, have I have demonstrated appropriate reliability for those moderate stakes decisions. They've demonstrated appropriate validity for those moderate stakes decisions. And in that final column, they have conducted bias analyses to determine if their items differentially identify uh, other groups. So um, I think that's, that's really helpful. The place that we need to continue to do more work and really uh, pay attention is the decisions that we make. As, uh, as human beings, we have assumptions about why a student performed a certain way on an assessment that we all need to uh, be conscious of and be aware of and how that's affecting the decisions that we make for students. And also whatever specific actions that we take in response to the assessment information that we're that we're using and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to um, more research in this area in particular okay so let's try to put this all together we talked about different users um, different decisions and data actually being um, having evidence to support those decisions that we would like to make with that data. I'm going to provide to you two different types of examples. Uh, the first example is going to be a computer adaptive testing assessment suite. And then the second example is going to be a curriculum based measurement type of assessment. So when we are thinking about matching data 
to decisions. Here I have on the left hand side, I'm just using, for example, today, the NWEA map growth assessment for grades uh, K through three at least. Um, and on the NWEA, um, they have these types of scores that are printed out on reports for schools to use. On the right hand side of the slide, I have a set of decisions that are commonly made by schools and are decisions that have shown to uh, accelerate students' learning. So let's make sure we match the, the data point with the decision correctly. So going through the technical manuals, um, I found that this overall RIT score, this overall score it spits out, this is the most, this score has the most evidence to support this moderate stakes decision of identifying which students need supplemental instruction. Okay, so now that we've identified those students, we really need to know what areas do these students need supplemental instruction? Um, and that's these other um, sub subtests that are there. Another uh, question that we have are, after a certain period of time, uh, are students making progress towards their end of year expectations? And the score that is best suited for that, again, is this overall RIT score. A lot of times people want to use the Lexile score uh, for this particular purpose. There is not currently any data to support using this score as a way to uh, mark progress towards end year expectations. That overall uh, score has evidence to suggest that use. Lexile does not. Another piece that's on there um, is focus skills. Um, and this also people want to use to determine what instructional content students need next, um, but it has not been, been validated for that, that purpose yet. Um, so that's just an example for computer adaptive assessment. Many of the other computer adaptive assessments works very similarly. Very quickly going to talk about grouping using CBM data and then turn it over to Lindy um, and she'll have some really excellent um, practical, how do I do this in school examples. So if you're using one of the curriculum-based measurement products, there's many of them out there. Uh, you can also do this um, larger grain to finer grain grouping of students using the curriculum-based measurement score. So for this one, we find um, if students are above benchmark on that, um, these students are most likely decoding pretty well, and you can focus more of the time on vocabulary, comprehension, and independent reading. Let's say the student is uh, below the fluency benchmark, but their accuracy in decoding is above 95%. These students will need, will benefit from some letter sound correspondence time, and then a lot of fluency building routines. Those students who really need um, the decoding, intensive decoding, their accuracy will typically be below 95% on that and then uh, students uh, especially the early elementary students who are still struggling with phoneme segmentation um, would benefit from the time being spent on phonemic awareness integrated with that letter sound correspondence so at this point i'm going to turn it over to lindy johnson and i look forward to your questions at the end Hello, everyone. Thank you for introducing me at the beginning, Beth. And thank you 
Adria for all that background information, which will be incredibly helpful as we go forward. Um, my section uh, will go into some more details um, and give a very specific um, practical example about what that this whole process looks like in a school. Um, as Beth mentioned, I am currently a PhD student at Michigan State University, and I am a National Center um, leadership for intensive intervention scholar. Um, so when you see us reference the National Center for Intensive Intervention, um, that is kind of the main organization that is, um, I'm receiving extra curriculum through them um, and programming through them. And they are training um, myself and 28 other scholars this year. And there's been another cohort as well um, that they are training to become experts in um, intensive intervention, uh, which is something that is much needed um, currently. And as Beth mentioned, I do have degrees in education in psychology. I have been a teacher in the elementary school school system here in Michigan. And I've also been specifically a reading interventionist and worked within the MTSS system um, within a school here in Michigan. So I have um, experience within this system and how it works. And it is at the elementary level. Um, perhaps at the end, we can address how this all might be applied to the secondary level. Um, but right now I'm going to focus on what this looks like at an elementary level and if you can think about um, how this might be just taken to the next level at a secondary level, uh, we can address that at the end. Um, so what does assessment actually look like? Because a lot of times when you read through these manuals and these guides, they are fantastic and I do recommend um, if not reading the entire guide that Adria recommended, at least reading through sections. Um, but it can be very overwhelming. And sometimes it just is really helpful to see what does this actually look like in practice. So that is what I'm here for. And to give you a really um, specific example of what this truly looks like. And this is coming from a school here in Michigan. Um, I want to give you um, practical, implementable ideas, not things that are unattainable. And for some of you may be thinking, okay, this is great, but can we really do this? Is this manageable? Is this affordable? Um, if, if we can do it, you can definitely do this. Um, and when I talk about um, the school, it is a Title I school that I worked at. So we did have Title I funding. Uh, and when we, when I talk about the assessments that we did, we did universal screening measures three times a year, fall, winter, and spring. And the three assessment screening tools that we did were DIBBLES, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. That would be the curriculum-based measure. We did a computer adapted assessment, which would be the STAR reading, and we did a reading inventory, which would be the Fountas and Pinnell benchmark assessment system, and that was given by the teachers. Um, the STAR reading was taken, of course, on a computer. Students did that individually. And the Dibbles assessment was given as uh, we called it the SWAT team approach, where the entire intervention team would go and occasionally we would even hire some extra help to come in, like literacy coaches from the, from the county to come in um, and help us because it was a very large school. Um, so we would, we would go do that through the entire school and we would try to get that done in a week or two for all the students in the um, entire school. Um, and so that was done three times a year. Um, progress monitoring, which we know is a key component of, of knowing how students are doing, um, not just within the intervention itself, but also within classrooms, um, that tier one level. Um, so that can be used 
for all students in that tier one, but we wouldn't do that as much. Um, as Adria mentioned, the more intense things become, the more you're going to uh, monitor. So for tier two and tier three, we would monitor, progress monitor weekly or biweekly, um, sometimes even monthly, depending on the exact level of the student. And I will go through that, how we leveled students and exactly how we place them. Uh, for students that are solely in tier one, um, there wasn't a specific guideline on how often to progress monitor, but we would recommend monthly um, or every six to eight weeks or so. And then um, what I think is incredibly important is that formative assessment piece. So these are the assessments that you're giving, uh, classroom teachers are giving, and interventionists might be giving as well, um, to really see where the students are at on a continuous basis so that they can in, they can change their instruction as needed. And this may be curriculum embedded. So in the particular school I was at, we used ReadyGen and Saxon Phonics as um, a supplemental curriculum. And the intervention programs had assessments within that as well. And then there were informal assessments that we would all do, the, the classroom teachers and the interventionists. So that could be discussions that you're having with your students to see how students are receiving the information. Conferences, individual conferences with students. This could be reading conferences that you're having. Tell me about the book that you're reading, um, checking for comprehension. Um, and this could be student responses. So this could be um, just a quick check. Um, sometimes we would call it, you know, give me a show of hands on a, on a hand. You might say, give me a, a five if you're feeling really confident about what I just taught or give me a one. And this may be more private where they're doing it on a whiteboard and they're showing it really fast and then hiding it. Um, this could be a thumbs up, thumbs to the side, thumbs down, but you're monitoring really quickly how the students are responding to your in instruction so that you can alter your instruction as needed. And you're really using those formative assessments to determine the level that students are at so that you can really um, meet the students where they're at, giving them lots of opportunities to respond. Um, so, we have all that assessment. We have their um, all their screening assessment that we have, all that data we've collected. Um, but what do we do? And this is a lot of times Adria was mentioning that this is where sometimes people get stuck. Um, we have all this assessment data in front of us, but what do we do? And this is where it's so important to ask those questions first, like she said what are you trying to find out? Ask the question first, then look at the data. So for us, we want to know what is the risk level of each student in our building? And when I talk about risk level, I'm talking about the likelihood of them failing the end of the year outcome. In third grade, that might be the M step. Um, for lower grades, it could be the uh, just being proficient at that grade level of reading. Uh, for older grades, secondary, it could be the SAT scores. Um, so when we're asking risk level, we're using those screening measures. So something like a Dibbles is going to give us with the composite score, it's going to break it down and say this child is at risk, they're some risk, they're negligible risk, or they're really no risk for reading difficulties. And then we could go forward once we know their risk level. Um, and then like she was saying, then we take their subtests. Um, it could be on the Dibbles, it could be on the STAR, um, could be accuracy on the oral reading fluency. And because there's not incredibly um, 
there's not a lot of data on this. So we would take teacher judgment on this to make decisions. And I'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, but we would take teacher judgments. So teacher um, input on what they think the student is is struggling with. And then now we can decide what intervention does that student need? Who is providing the intervention? And in what format? So we first, just to reiterate, we first ask the questions, then we collect the data. Now we're going to evaluate the data to figure out what the student needs. So it's data driven, but we ask the questions first. And how did we do that? We did it as a team. I can't imagine trying to do this on an individual basis as a classroom teacher all alone on an island um, looking at my, my students' data. I can't imagine trying to figure this all out on my own. It is overwhelming to say the least. So teamwork was where it was at. So we, our school had a data team and we worked together and we found it depends on your school but we found that the grade level teams worked really well for planning and for decision making number one they had a common planning time now this may not be the case in all schools in our school the administrator worked incredibly hard at aligning the schedules to be this way on purpose and it wasn't it, part of it was for this and part of it was for another reason, which I'll get into as soon as we get into um, interventions and how we did this. But it was also because they had a common ELA block. They scheduled um, not only their planning time together, but they also scheduled their ELA block at the same time. So they were all teaching reading at the same time. And that is going to come into play in just a minute. When I get to that slide, you'll see why that is incredibly important for this. On the data team, the administrators there, very important, not just for planning purposes, but um, just also to be there and to have input as far as all of this goes, because there is a lot that goes into this. Um, the grade level teachers, uh, the special educator, which is a key component, um, the school psychologist, which might also need to be there, um, might these two might play a, a big role and also other personnel that may be involved, other service providers that may be involved with students, um, especially at that tier three level where they may be getting more intensive support. Uh, we have we had a literacy coach as well. Um, we had um, our intervention team, which there were depending on the year, but there were usually about four of us. And then any paraprofessionals that may be involved um, at the grade level or with specific students. Um, just so you know, there was about a half day for each grade. And so there is cost involved um, because each grade level teacher would require a substitute for a half day. So there is some planning and administrative cost involved. But I think when we go through this and you see how it works out, um, when we talk about cost benefit analysis, you can see I think the benefit to the students far outweigh the cost of any um, any small cost of the substitutes for half day. And I know that there's um, some difficulty in that. And so there may be, you know, you might have to get creative in how that works. But I think it is. Um, this was a key component to that. Um, and each person on the team is incredibly important. They each have their expertise. And I think it is um, very beneficial to have each person on the team. Okay, so let's get into it. This is the portrait of how it works. And this is going to take a little bit of explaining. I'll do my best. Please ask any questions afterwards. Again, this is one single school. It doesn't mean that this is going to work for every school, but I think, like I said in the beginning, that it helps to see how it worked in one school. And you can see how it works in one school, and if it works, and if you can take even one piece of it and apply it to something else, then I think that I would be happy. 
Um, so each grade level teacher is responsible for one of the areas of the content. So one of those essential skills, basically. And we didn't hit all of the essential skills, as you'll see as I go across. Not all of them are here, and you'll see that they're, we kind of added a little bit, and you'll see some of them maybe combined. And I'll break it down a little bit more as we go. So just for um, to keep it anonymous, we have classroom teacher A, B, C, D, and E. And then we have interventionist one, two, three, four, and then the special educator. As far as what they're teaching. Now, remember, all of the classroom teachers are all teaching their intervention or all teaching the ELA block at the same time. So just for example's sake, we are all teaching reading from 10 to 1030 Monday through Thursday. Now, I just put this as an example just because we needed something here. So at 10 o'clock, all students, and I'm going to go into how we broke it down, all students who were yellow and who needed phonics, I will, don't worry, I'll go into how we broke it down, would go to classroom teacher A. And classroom teacher A is teaching the intervention of phonics for reading. Classroom teacher B is teaching phonics as well, but their students are a little bit higher. Their students were getting yellow and green scores and they are receiving the ready gen intervention. Now classroom teacher C is teaching fluency. So their students needed a little bit more, they're not struggling as much with the word decoding, but they're really struggling with the fluency. So this teacher is going to be teaching readers theater, maybe leveled out from reading A to Z. And this classroom teacher is teaching comprehension and they're going to use book clubs to do that. So they're probably going to break out um, different book clubs. They're gonna have maybe 20 students and maybe they're going to do five book clubs with four students in each. And they're each going to be leveled. Um, each group is going to be a different level based on what those students need. But those students aren't the struggling readers. They just really need to focus more on the comprehension. And then we've got our, our students that scored, if you're talking about, um, we're talking about dibbles when I'm talking about the colors here. So this is their risk level. Blue would be they have basically no risk. They are well above benchmark. These students really need extension activities. They are a lot of times in tiered uh, uh, response to intervention in the tiers um, MTSS system. They're the ones that kind of go unnoticed. Um, we found, and they're the ones who still need support, but they need a higher level of support. They need to be um, challenged in a different way. They need to be challenged to go beyond. And so this classroom teacher, um, we called it their passion project. So each student would decide on a topic and they are doing research. They are taking their passion and they are researching it. So they're learning some research skills. And it's not to say that other students don't need that, but during this time when other students are really focusing in on things that they're missing, these students are able to go beyond. Now, when these students are in these classes, we are also taking, the interventionists are taking the students who are the highest needs. So we, being interventionists, who had more training, some more education perhaps in reading. Um, we're taking the ones who are the most at risk and need some more intensive support. So one interventionist could be focusing on phonics. And I just put some examples here. It doesn't mean that's exactly what we did. Um, one possible intervention that we were doing was taking um, Fontes and Pinnell's LLI. Um, and including uh, Wilson's foundations as well. Um, we have 
maybe two phonics groups, and this one is just doing LLI. We had an intervention group doing um, fluency, but they're lower, as you can see, than this group. This is our yellow group, our more at-risk group. So they're getting a more um, intensive support because they're in a smaller group and um, they're going to be more targeted. They're going to be doing more targeted um, activities in this group. And then our other interventionist is going to be doing comprehension and their program is going to be scholastic guided reading. Um, their scores could be red or yellow. And then our special educator is also taking their students during this time and they have their individualized instruction. Okay, I know that looks really confusing and I, there'll probably be a bunch of questions. I wanna show you before, I wanna show you how we figured out which students go in which group. And this may also be confusing. Hopefully I'll be able to explain it. Let me show you. Our MTSS coordinator figured out or designed a system where we took each student's screening scores and we basically added them so they were not weighted. So for example, I'm going to look at this first row right here, this student right here. This is their BAS score, but we added a zero onto it just to make it a little bit more equal to the other scores. So their score would actually be a nine. And then we just made it into a 90. So it's a little bit closer to these other ones. So she summed 90 plus 129 plus 19. So this student their sum score of all three scores, their BAS score plus their STAR score plus their Dibbles composite score is 238. That gives you the sum of all three scores on all three screening measures. So she did that for each student. I don't have their names, obviously, for de-identification purposes. So their student's name would be over here. And this is ranked in order lowest to highest all the way through the grade level. So we would look at each specific student, this person, then we would look through their scores, evaluate, she's color coded it so we can see, okay, red, they're well below benchmark on this one. They are well below benchmark on this one. And we can, we can see where they're ranked in order with their grade level, we can see across the board what their scores are like. And then we would ask the teachers to come with their BAS file, with their, their data binders. We would have their Dibbles booklets or their printed out scores pulled up so we could see their subtest scores. We would have all this information in front of us, all of that data that we collected. This is our data meeting. Our data meeting is going through each individual student so that we can place them, let me go back, into the correct classroom. So all students from this example is third grade. All students from third grade are ranked and then placed into one of these groups depending on their specific need. So let me go through just a couple. I'm going to go really quick because I don't want to run out of time. Here's one example. Of course, I made up a name. We've got Drew here. He was the lowest score and his scores across the row are all red, which means he is very, very high risk of not doing well. So because he's third grade, he's a very high risk of failing the M step in third grade at the end of the year. And we pull out, by the way, this would, the BAS score, if you're familiar with BAS, that would be a level nine, and which would equal I. Um, in third grade, that's very low. Um, so if we're looking at his star scores, 
We're seeing he's got difficulty in all areas. It's not just one um, specific essential skill. He needs everything. Um, so we are putting him into a group um, that is going to address everything. He's going to get every skill in that group. So he's not going to be in just a comprehension group. He's not going to be in just a phonics group or a fluency group. He's going to get everything in his group. It's going to be very intense. Um, he's going to be just three or four students. So he's not going to be in one of the classrooms that has the 20 students, the bigger, the bigger classrooms. He's going to get progress monitored weekly. Um, this was something that our school decided because we want to know if he's not doing well, we want to know so that we can alter the plan. And I don't think I can click on this to show you, but to alter the plan, there is a link and we can um, either put it into the chat or do something later with NCII has a great um, handout and a whole module that you can go through called the taxonomy of intensive intervention. And you can go through what, if you are seeing a student is not making progress, your progress monitoring, the student is not making progress. You can go through and you can look at which intervention program they're getting. How much evidence is there for that program? based on the levels of ESSA, just like Adria was talking about. There is a rubric that NCII pr provides that you can go through. You can look at the frequency that the student is getting their intervention. How many days a week? How long? The duration? Is it 15 minutes? Is it 30 minutes? Is it 45 minutes? Um, the group size? Are they in this three to four um, students per group? Are they in a 25 kids per group that could matter are they in a um is there is the intervention meeting their needs so if i'm looking at a student who needs phonics is that student in a comprehension group so is it aligned to what they need there is a rubric on their site um so we are if there is no progress we are going to start looking at altering some of those variables. We may alter which interventionist. Maybe there is um, a particular interventionist that is better at teaching a certain skill. So those are the variables that we may start um, keeping track of and um, trying to figure out what does the student need and keeping track of that so that if the student needs to move from tier two to tier three, that we have this all documented to say, this is what we've done. Um, I did have a couple of other um, examples, but I just want to just quickly go through them because they are basically the same. Um, we've got another student who has, um, of course, when we're doing this, students aren't all the same. So we're not always going to have all red students and all yellow students and all green students and all blue students. Um, they're going to have a mix. And so you've got to look at what does the student need because that's what this is all about. So in this student's case, um, perhaps this student was showing um, difficulty in decoding. So this is what that student needs. She needs to be in an intervention that is more phonics based. Um, and again, if there's no progress, we're going to be altering it. Depending on the intensity and what the student needs, it could be biweekly because she's not as low as this other student. So she might just need a biweekly. Um, and again, this is all decided in that data meeting with all of the um, experts. And just so you know, um, Dibbles is not a diagnostic assessment, so we are not trying to diagnose the student with anything. Um, these are just hypotheses that we are saying, you know, we think that this student is really struggling with decoding, so we're going to try to put her in a phonics-based intervention and see how it works. If she if she starts making progress, then we know that's probably what happened, but it is not um, a diagnostic assessment that a school psychologist might give to say, oh, okay, this student is struggling with this. This is not 
a diagnostic assessment. Um, this is a student that would just be um, a couple of yellow scores and a green. So this student isn't struggling quite as much as the others. Um, and because there are really no guidance um, that has been published on how to use multiple data points. So because our school used three different data points for screening, um, we there is no data or there is no guidance on how to do that. So we use teacher judgment in this case. And we said to the teacher that had Connor in class, what do you think Connor needs some help with? Because he's struggling somewhere, but we're, we're not really sure what exactly. So um, the teacher would say, you know, I, I from when I read with him, the BAS, um, I really felt like he struggled answering those comprehension questions. So I think he needs to be in that comprehension focused classroom. So he's not going to be with the interventionist. He's going to be back in that um, intervention. Uh, he's going to be back in that comprehension focused classroom with the teacher, um, the whole the teacher that's leading those lessons. And he's not going to be progress monitored quite as much as our more intensive students. Um, and then, like I said, one of the key components is going to be formative assessment. So really tracking students to see how they're doing within each tier. So our tier one uh, teachers, our classroom teachers are doing those curriculum embedded um, assessments. So ReadyGen has its own uh, unit test, which would be more of the uh, summative assessment. So uh, student responses would be more of the formative assessments within ReadyGen. Uh, Saxon Phonics has um, assessments within that are more formative that they can the, the teachers would use to do more groupings. Um, uh, we would do progress monitoring, and for our tier two and three, we would use Dibbles. We would use nonsense word fluency for first and second grade and the oral reading fluency um, for uh, third grade. And um, for myself specifically as an interventionist, on top of the Dibbles monitoring that we did for progress monitoring, I would also um, progress monitor, if you would call it that, or do a formative assessment on specific skills and content that I am working on with my specific groups. So for example, if I'm working with a group on word families, I want to know if the students are understanding what I'm talking about, if they are picking up those skills. So I'm going to be giving some quick checks, probably weekly, to see how they're doing. Just a really quick dipstick measurement to see how are they doing. So it's not a formal assessment. This isn't anything that goes on a report card. This is just for my instruction. So I know whether or not I need to go back and reteach, if I need to focus more on certain skills, um, or if I can go on, if they're really getting it and I can go on. Um, and within the progress monitoring, within the dibbles, within the nonsense word fluency, and within the oral reading fluency, I'm also doing some error analysis so that I can see what those students are missing if they're making errors. I can also look at the progress monitoring and the dibbles to see what students are, are struggling with within the dibbles. So the dibbles test itself might not tell me, but I can look and I can say, wow, if I gave the student this nonsense word fluency probe and the only um, words that they missed, the only nonsense words they missed were the ones that had the short E sound in them, I'm gonna probably start focusing on the short E sound with that student and possibly with that group if they're all missing the same thing. Um, so key takeaways from hopefully mine and Adria's as well. You need to start with a question. When you are doing any kind of assessments, you need to ask your questions first. What are you trying to find out from your assessments? Start with your questions before you look at your data. Please assess in multiple ways. Not just, I'm not, I don't mean just screeners, but 
looking at those um, formative assessments, the interim assessments, meaning the uh, benchmark. And also, of course, we're going to be looking at the summative, like the M steps, so that we can make some big decisions. Um, hopefully from my uh, part, you saw that teams are so important. Please don't go it alone. I think it's so much, not just better, but more fun when you are with a team. Um, you can you can really, we, we ended up having a lot of fun in our data meetings and I think you can make it fun. Um, some people look at data and they just see big headaches, but to me, I enjoy it, of course. That's why I'm here at Michigan State now doing this. Um, but I think you can make it fun as well. Um, don't just let the data sit there. Use the data to inform your decisions. So we're not just taking these assessments and just letting the data sit there. Please use it to inform your decisions on students. Use it to drive your instruction. That's what those formative assessments are all about. Use it to change how you are um, instructing students. What does the student need? The assessments are possible. I know it can seem overwhelming, but it is manageable. We can do it, especially as a team. And it is imperative, especially right now, as we are coming out of and still sort of in this pandemic world where students have um, struggled and they are still struggling. We need to help accelerate student learning. And this is, I think, one of the most important pieces for helping us do that. We need to know where students are at so that we can drive their learning forward. And hopefully you can see how important it is to invest in these early elementary grade levels because we really need to focus on their skills so that we can address them early so that it doesn't get to be so difficult when they get to the uh, later days. So that is my, are there any questions? I'm sure there are. <laughs> there are lots of questions. Excellent job, both of you. Thank you so much. I am gonna, um, and in the background, um, maybe, um, Andrea was shared a Padlet, so I had put the questions right on there, and I shared it in the participant chat also. So you might be getting some questions after. Thank you for for being willing to do that. So you, um, I'm just going to go ahead and ask you the ones um, that are in there that kind of went together. Um, one question where is where the data kept and who is responsible for crafting the interventional plans for students in tier two and three um it is one of the questions that's, mm -hmm. that's you okay can you say that one more time where's the data so, kept yep where's the data kept and who is responsible for crafting the interventional plans for students in tier two and three sure so um depending on which data you're talking about um the the main data points are kept in a um system through the school and it is a computerized system that is secure so not anyone can have access to it which i think is very important mm -hmm. um, and then the person that is responsible for the intervention what was the question one more time who is responsible for crafting the plans for students in tier two and three that would be the whole data team so we all work together to do that. That's not just one person that is responsible for that. And I think that that is a blessing because it takes the responsibility off of just one person for being responsible. Um, it's all of us. We're all responsible for all students in the building. Okay, thank you. Another question is um, it, very specific. The BAS told you Drew was high risk along with start and doubles. So we'd have to kind of go back to that. Okay. For example of Drew. Okay. Did you want me to go back to that? Uh, I mean, if we have, well, let's ask, if you Is could look at that, I'm not sure if you could, then I Dr. Could well, Andrea, you could answer the one of the first questions that came up. Could you um, give examples of how this would be used in secondary? Yeah, so secondary is a little bit of a different animal, but reading development is still the same. 
So uh, many of the assessments that I talked about scale up to grades eight or 10, especially the computer, computer adaptive assessments. And then um, CDMs tend to scale to grades six or eight because uh, most kids tend to master decoding by that point in time. However, it's still important if uh, a person hasn't developed their decoding, um, we can instruct that all the way through adulthood. We have lots of stories of wonderful um, adults at age 50 or later who learn to decode and that um, changes their lives. So these pieces uh, the, that word decoding and the language comprehension are both really important um, to understand. However, they tend to clump together in secondary. So we see students performing um, similarly, either high across the board, medium across the board, or lower across the board on all of those skills. So when we're thinking about programming for the, the lower performing students, what we want to do is make sure it's really intensive instruction that incorporates decoding, especially multisyllabic words, and really focuses in on that morphological piece of how the letter sound correspondence associates with meaning. And then we also want to incorporate it across, uh, across content areas. So literacy isn't just happening in ELA, it's happening in science and social studies and math and helping, uh, especially the content area teachers learn really effective vocabulary strategies to teach their content vocabulary, as well as understanding the scientific language, the academic language that's inherent in, in their content and understanding that uh, all students would benefit from, from tackling some of these language pieces, but it definitely needs to be more intensive, especially for those students who are performing the lower areas. Uh, Sharon Vaughn has some phenomenal uh, work in this. If you go to the Texas LD Center website, they have wonderful resources on um, instruction that uh, has shown effects um, but again, I'm going to put the plug in for catching them early because our effect sizes, if you get it really early in elementary, are, are three times the size of the effect sizes that we can get in later middle school and high school, which we do, we need to address that there too, but um, it's really worth it at the elementary level. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so can you go ahead and answer that question, Lindy? Of of the Drew question? We yeah. have about six minutes, so. So the question, I'm not sure what the question is. It just says BAS okay. told you told Drew you. was high risk. So um, along with the start and dibble. So Crystal asked that question. If you uh, in the chat want to clarify that, Crystal, um, I will pass it along to. So just Andy. for reference, if you're not sure, um, what the typical levels are. Um, for example, uh, so level I is what it shows Drew at, and this is third grade. And just for reference, a student um, is supposed to be, quote unquote, supposed to be at a level J by the end of first grade. So that is well below where they're supposed to be by third grade. Okay. okay. Um Another couple questions that kind of go together. Um, what grade level does the system begin? Is it kindergarten was one? And why would you need a, a special education group at all? Sure. Uh, yes, we did start interventions. Um, well, we, we, we progress monitor for the whole school starting in kindergarten. Um, and the intensive interventions um, tier two don't usually start at the beginning of kindergarten, mostly because the students are learning how to do school. Uh, they're learning how to, um, to be in a school setting for a lot of them. So we didn't start intensive interventions quite yet. Um, we would usually start intensive intervention after the, the winter benchmark for kindergartners who were still showing at risk, because a lot of times those beginning scores can be low kind of across the board for kindergartners. Um, although we do screen for kindergarten, um, we didn't start intensive intervention until after winter uh, screening. And then the second question I believe was why do you- Why is special education needed at all? Sure, so that's um, the, that would be tier three 
Mm -hmm. would be incredibly intensive support needs. So that would be students who, even within a small group of uh, students of three to four, maybe struggle. It could be students mm -hmm. with um, an IEP who specifically have already been diagnosed with per perhaps a learning disability or um, a specific reading disability mm -hmm. and their needs are best met one-on-one -on -one or in a smaller group of, of perhaps two. Um, they may get more support from a, um, a, a special education teacher, um, different uh, individualized support as well. So mm -hmm. there are definitely reasons why we have um, a special education teacher. They're more specialized, they give different supports um, and it's more intense as well. Mm -hmm. So all that tax taxonomy of the intensity, the support level, the matching of the needs, all of those things are just more intense with a, mm -hmm. with a special educator. Thank you. Um, Andrea might have more to, to say as well. Okay. One um, that Alexis, who has asked quite a few questions, thank you, Alexis, um, just wrote in. She said, would you say that this example of reading intervention fits with the dyslexia package of bills? Oh, I just bumped up that are in committee and would address the issues those bills take on regarding use of reading instruction that addresses characteristics of dyslexia and structured lit literacy? Yeah, what a wonderful question. Um, so reading disabilities in general are a broad category that capture dyslexia as well. Um, it, it really depends on what the final text of that of those bills look like. But yes, um, most of the things that I have seen have focused on early, very early screening, um, which Michigan has been doing a lot of. So. Uh, kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, um, looking at screening for reading. Then the other piece is making sure that there's a high quality instruction that has had an evidence base or meets SL levels one or two. Um, that's very similar in um, dyslexia legislation. So, um, yeah, all of this is uh trying to get at the point where every child should receive high quality reading instruction um, that meets their needs and then students with dyslexia their specific needs um but these models uh, for the development that we show uh, work somewhat similarly for students with dyslexia um, and other reading disabilities so it'll be interesting to see where that goes in the future Thank you, and, and Alexa said thank you for explaining that. Um, I just do want to point out that in the chat, I put the evaluation um, at 123. So for people participating, if you could please give us feedback. But of course, we'll share with our presenters, but we want to make sure that we um, can continue these wonderful events and um, get feedback for the presenters and for us to keep um, providing providing these events. So. We are wrapping up. It's 129. We can maybe squeeze in one last question. I thank you all for, for coming today. But Carla asked, one last question. Are you aware of similar models from schools with a reading recovery program? And just so you guys know, I shared that Padlet and I saw that Andrew is already starting to answer questions in there. So you'll have, you can put questions in there yourself and also um, go back to see, get your answers from both of them. So Again, are you aware of similar models from schools with a reading recovery program? I am not personally aware of any. Um, okay. Uh, but I will definitely I'll be happy to answer the uh, Padlet questions. I'll uh, hop okay. on there and answer any unanswered questions here probably before 4 o'clock this afternoon. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. I, we appreciate your time and taking the time to answer these questions and continue to answer. You've given your people a little window into your wealth of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.